you are welcome to my channel still on cytosomiasis and this is going to be part of the signs and symptoms but i will limit it to neurocytosomiasis alone why that we want to know how exactly cytosomiasis can give us central nervous system or neurological problems without further ado let's go when it comes to the full presentation on signs and symptoms of cytosomiasis that has been published here and here is the link if you click on this very link it will take you to all necessary facts that you need to know about signs and symptoms of schizosomiasis. Please click on this link. Now, I don't have the spinal cord to show you, but here is where the spinal cord is located, the vertebral column. Again, the spinal cord is firmly protected by the backbone. Here is the brain. The brain will be affected. By way of introduction, neurosomiasis is all about the fact that schizosomiasis can cause neurological problems at the level of the spinal cord, even up to the brain. And it is going to be helpful to note that this can occur even in the travelers so you don't have to be in the endemic zone before you can have neurosomiasis can occur in travelers can occur in individuals with low burden of infection or high one so what still we've gone through signs and symptoms right and we've been able to narrow down no certain signs and symptoms to a particular species of sosomiasis. For example, when there is hematuria or no infertility and so on, we narrow that to sosomimatobia. Or when there is gastrointestinal issues, we'll refer to the rest. In this case, neurosomiasis can be caused by all, all species. Of Let's go through the pattern. You can see the brain here. Okay? And this will cover both the spinal cord and the brain at the same time. When there is hematogenous spread through embolization of adult worms, that adult worms will later on lay eggs. And the eggs could be along the microcirculation or cycle of willies in the brain. In the case of spinal cord, the eyes could be laid directly on the spinal cord. The presence of the eggs will lead to cascade of events. Now, it's gonna trigger a serious inflammatory process. And then that will lead to formation of granulomas. You know, you know the process of, of granulomatous formation, right? Mm -hmm. A granuloma is just an aggregate or cluster of white blood cells that we come up, you know, as a result of infection or secondary to infection. Then when that has occurred, there will be, of course, pressure effect, ischemia, and then destruction of the surrounding tissue leading to scary. 25 to 30% of the spinal cord related neurological problems could be traceable to osteosomiasis in endemic zones. And then there is something specific about osteosomiasis and spinal cord you know, problems. It's going to be mostly limited to, to the lower portion of the spinal cord, mostly the conus medullaris and Equina. We will go through an Ocular Equina syndrome later on, and then we'll go through how it affects the brain proper later on. So that is how we'll get here. 
Now, the signs and symptoms of neurosomiasis when it comes to the spinal cord. First of all, let's talk about myelopathy. Spinal cord damage can manifest as myelopathy. Myelopathy means all sorts of neurological problems associated with spinal cord leading to abnormal function or dysfunction. Usually, it is known to be caused by degenerative diseases, that is myelopathy, right? Or tumor or trauma. But it may be due to schizosomiasis. So that is why I'm making this presentation. This is a serious spinal cord compression or stenosis that is secondary to pressure effect on the spinal cord. Remember, I've just gone through the part where the adult ones through embolization can end up laying eggs you know, in the microcirculation or directly on the spinal cord, causing inflammatory process to take place around the eggs, forming granulomatous disease and pressure effect. So there will be stenosis. And that may lead to a significant and sometimes permanent nerve damage. How do we know? There may be paralysis. Even it depends on which part is affected, it may lead to death. It may lead to death, particularly when it is involving the cervical spine, and that will be an acute emergency. Other features of myelopathy will be difficulty walking, loss of balance, weakness along the lower limbs, and the individual will find it difficult to write or use the hands perfectly because that won't be happening anymore with myelopathy. Other clinical features of spinal cord injury here will be lower limb pain. Lower motor neuron lesion is a possibility with bladder paralysis, fecal incontinence, particularly when we are dealing with coda equina syndrome. Impotency, sadu anesthesia, all will occur with coda equina syndrome. Remember, I said while going through the part that when it comes to the spinal cord, it's going to affect the lower part of the spinal cord more, and that is called medullaris and coda equina. But I have a separate presentation on Cola Equina syndrome already published. You can go through, through this very length. Then we are going to end this about spinal cord with a condition known as transverse myelitis. Um, in this case, the transverse myelitis will be rapidly progressive when it is as a result of cystosomiasis. But you don't need to bother your head too much. I have a separate presentation on transverse myelitis already published right here. Just click on this very link and that will take you to full info on transverse myelitis. Now, signs and symptoms of neurosomiasis when it comes to the brain. Lesions are the cerebral cortex may be single, but sometimes could be multiple. And the clinical features here will include headache, seizures, upper motor neuron lesions presentation, motor and sensory impairment. But that is not the end of the road. There may be cerebellar syndrome. And with cerebral syndrome, the individual will have gait anomaly, abnormal posture, hypotonia, speech disorder, dysdiagnosis, tremor, oculomotor anomalies, dysmetria, and asynergia. Also, might be faced with multifocal encephalopathy 
where the affected individual will present with clumsiness, dysarthria, partial blindness, and even the individual could have rapid deterioration mentally. There may be cognitive impairment, then we'll be able to trace multifocal encephalopathy to eosinophy mediated toxicity because that is going to be the cause of multifocal encephalopathy. The cerebral associative vasculitis that is secondary to schizosomiasis can actually occur without eosinophilia. But multifocal encephalopathy will occur due to eosinophy mediated toxicity. Because of that, my next presentation will be on eosinophy mediated toxicity. Now, eosinophy mediated toxicity. A while ago, I promised that my next presentation would be on eosinophy mediated toxicity, but I've decided to put it here right now so that we can merge the multifocal encephalopathy with this entity immediately. The pathway is essentially that eosinophil will glue to chisosomolar coated with antibody and complement. Then eosinophil peroxidase will be released. When it is released, that will bind to the surface of the chisosomolar, and that will be leading to surface bond eosinophil peroxidase that will eventually enhance the eosinophil mediated toxicity against the affected parasite. So that is how eosinophil mediated toxicity can cause multifocal encephalopathy. You could see that putting it here today will be more you know, helpful. Now, let's briefly go through the possible causes of eosinophils. If you have clicked on the presentation that I presented on schizomiasis, signs and symptoms, if you have clicked on that link, you would have gotten the explanation right there that most times in the non-endemic zones, travelers might have forgotten that they visited endemic zones, and now they are having problems associated with schizomiasis. The first clue to the physician in the non-endemic zone will be the high level of eosinophil that will you know, trigger that kind of thinking is parasite present anywhere and then the journey will you know, start from there. So now let's go through what are the possible causes of high level of eosinophil. We have the parasites, the fungal infection, allergy, toxins, endocrine no, disorders, tumors, hay fever, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ostrative colitis and asthma. But out of all this, two, two possible causes will be responsible for high level of eosinophil, and that will be parasitic infections and allergy. With that, I've come to the end of this presentation. Please remember to share this on your platform. Remember to subscribe to my channel. Remember to leave comments. You no, know, or tell me any other you know, aspect of medicine you want me to touch. With that, I'm saying a big thank you.